What's going on team? I just wrapped up a uh, weekend coaching session with one of my clients who's a VP of product at a interesting company and he was asking me about uh, hiring PM directors and if I had any advice or good reading material and I said, you know, that's such an interesting question. I haven't covered it on my Fireside PM uh, podcast or Substack uh, in the past. So I thought, well, I'll just put a quick one together and this will be helpful to him and hopefully anybody else that's watching. So this is based on over 20 years of product management experience and probably hiring uh, maybe over over 100 PMs. <laughs> and many of them were PM managers, uh, group product managers or directors of product management. Um, so let me share with you over the years some uh, high level things that I ask myself when I'm, uh, you know, trying to fill a role on, on my team. And, um, this is geared towards product management hiring, but I could see this being pretty broadly applicable, but this will be from the position of you are the CPO or the VP of product. You're the head of product for some big area and you need to hire some, um, people managers or, um, directors onto your team. So the first question that you want to really ask yourself is, you know, why are we hiring for this role? And it's very easy once you get that headcount or you make the decision, you're going to make a hire that you'll just start collecting resumes and sorting them by logos or experience in your vertical. And those are definitely signals to look for. Um, but it is important just like, you know, when you're, designing a new product or even just a new feature to be really intentional and clear about what problem we're trying to solve with this hire. Uh, and also making sure that everyone in your uh, org uh, generally agrees like, oh yeah, you know, we think we should add this person because we need this new expertise or there's a kind of product management excellence uh, opportunity for improving a specific area that the team currently is not as strong in or, oh, you know, you're overwhelmed and you need more bandwidth and the bandwidth you need is around this track of work that's currently on your plate or you're backfilling someone who's no longer on the team and, um, that person needs to accomplish these things that new hire needs to accomplish these new things. So, um, while it is always good to have a strong baseline um, kind of skill set and bar for hiring. The reality is that, especially nowadays, headcount is so precious uh, and hiring decisions are so impact impactful that you've got, you want to do more than, oh, we're, we're just hiring another PM lead and we just want an overall athlete. Um, there was a time when that made sense, like, especially in a bull market or you're at a company that's just growing crazy and you just need to build out, like, you know, build out a talent across the board. And then it's like, okay, then let's just find great, smart, hardworking, fun people. I think in today's day and age, uh, we want to be a little bit more strategic about our hiring. And the first step of doing that is being really clear on why we're making a hire, what problem we're looking to solve. The next question to ask yourself is, can I solve hard problems with this person? Um, as much as you are evaluating a stack of resumes or a slate of candidates, you are also looking for someone that you can work with. And that is a match for how you work, your values, your beliefs, your personality, and you know, you're going to be stuck in an airport with this person at some point. You are going to be pulling an all-nighter with this person at some point. You're both going to be under a lot of pressure from, you know, your leadership at some point. And in those situations, is this the person that you're going to be excited to chat and say, hey, can we hop on a quick, you know, video call to talk about this hard thing? Or are you going to be like, oh, man, I got to work with Bob or Jane on this. Like, uh, you know, so, you know, find someone that you're going to be like uh, excited to work with and that compliments you and for whom you have great chemistry uh, because no amount of logos or kind of um, 
signals uh, that are very impressive will offset a uh, lack of chemistry. And, and when I say chemistry, I mean, can you solve hard problems together? Are the solutions you're going to come up with better because this person was part of that process with you? And will you enjoy working with this person? And will they enjoy working with you? Next one. Uh, anytime you make a hire, it is a great opportunity to balance the portfolio. And, you know, as an example, I'm an ideas guy. So in the past, when I've hired people who are really organized executors, my God, I love freaking working with them. And turns out they really enjoy working with people like me because like, uh, they know their value. Then maybe they kind of pick up some insights that they might not have gotten if they worked for a master executor. Uh, and so it kind of is a win for everybody. Um, there is a scenario where especially early managers will kind of look for people that look like them. It can work. Uh, certainly it makes it easier from the chemistry side, but do you get breakthrough ideas? Are you going to be able to do things like, is this a one plus one equals three situation? It's rare, you know, um, now you could think about more junior versions of yourself, maybe as skip levels, like really kind of on the ground executors, like that's okay if they look like you. Um, but for your direct reports, um, you don't really want a core team meeting or direct report meeting where everybody kind of has the same worldview and perspective and there's no tension or there's no kind of divergent thinking. Now there's a limit to that where if it's too divergent, it's just a freaking, you know, it's chaotic. So um, you want someone that will complement your weak spots um, but maybe isn't your polar opposite either. So something to think about. Now that we found someone that, you know, we think can solve the problem that we're trying to solve by opening up this role, um, you know, and they complement uh, your, your strengths uh, and weaknesses, and you've got good chemistry with them so far, now you want to really take the test drive. So everything we talked about has been fairly superficial. This is probably the most important part of the hiring process for me, which is like, okay, can we actually solve a problem together before I hire you? Um, and this isn't necessarily the same as a case study where you're grilling them on something, but this is really where you're like, hey, I'm literally going, um, trying to make a decision here on, you know, this product problem or this strategy problem or this customer problem. like. Can we work together and figure out like what we think is the best thing? And it's, it's literally the conversation you would have had with this person, had they been hired on their first or second day, you know, or maybe first week, why not test drive that conversation now? Why do all of this kind of pomp and circumstance of the hiring process? And then like, when they start work, you're like, okay, now we're going to have real conversations. It's like, well, if you can have the real conversation before you pull the trigger, it's in everybody's interest because if it works out great, you have major confidence in the hire and they have probably more likely uh, yield for you if you extend an offer. They're more likely to accept it. And if it doesn't work out, my God, we all have been there. If there's a hire that doesn't work out, it is painful and expensive and stressful and time consuming for everybody involved, for you, for the candidate, for your manager, for the candidate's direct reports, for your peers, it's a real uh, kick in the uh, stomach. So having those test drives early, uh, and it, why don't we do this? Part of it is we tend to maybe feel like, well, I don't want to show too many of my cards, or I don't want to, um, I feel like they already nailed their case interview, like, why do I need to do this? You know, case interviews are things that people prepare for. Um, actual test drive project work together, as much as you can do that in a one hour interview or with some async kind of, um, you know, document commentary or whatever, like it just goes a really long way. And in any case that I've found a hire didn't, wasn't the right match, 
subsequently, I always ask myself, man, I think I probably could have detected this earlier had I spent more time doing some pre-hire work. Um, in the old days, people would bristle at doing that, candidates. They would say, oh, you know, I'm not going to work for free or whatever. Good news is if you're hiring, you have a lot of latitude now in this market. And so I don't want you to take advantage of people. Um, I really do look at it as a service to the candidate. And you could always compensate them if you want to um, or, you know, give them a nice gift card or something. But uh, ultimately, it'll save everybody a lot of pain and moreover, um, can help you figure out like the real, you know, strong hires from the hires. Okay, now we've figured out the problem, good chemistry, we could, uh, they compliment you, maybe you did a little bit of test drive exercises and you're like, I think this is the person. Your next opportunity is do some um, reference checks against their track record. And uh, this is often looked at as a rubber stamping exercise, but you know, I think uh, in the spirit of Ericos for making hires, uh, you wanna give yourself every opportunity to uncover potential misunderstandings or blind spots that you have and the perfect situation is you work with someone that worked with them and you can ask them. Um, the second is you work with someone that is in the same company but hasn't worked directly with them. And then the next best thing is you work with someone that knows someone that worked with them or at least you know people that know that, that product or team or company well. But um, the main point here is you know, the interview process it's a little bit like the dating process. You're seeing information that, uh, you know, obviously is designed to uh, put the candidate in the best light that they can put themselves in. And every now and then you'll come across a candidate that's like fully transparent, but you almost can't blame them. Like if they know every other candidate's gonna, uh, you know, self-advocate uh, very effectively, why would they um, highlight any of their their flaws or weaknesses to you. Now they could do it because they feel like, well, they want you to not hire them if there's not a good fit. But that requires a little bit of trust in the process that uh, we shouldn't assume. So um, you should assume that the candidate's gonna put their best, best foot forward. They're not gonna go out of their way to reveal their struggles or weaknesses. So you're gonna wanna figure that out in other ways and reference checks, especially kind of back channel stuff uh, is best. Obviously, if they give you a bunch of references, you can pretty much assume that they'll be very positive. Although even in those cases, uh, you know, a well done reference call can sometimes identify things that are material and relevant for your decision. So um, that is, I think the last question. Ooh, no, there's one more. So we've done like, oh, let's be methodical. Let's be intentional. At the end of the day, you know, after a day or two, uh, you're gonna have a gut feel like, oh yeah, I really like, you know, candidate three. And if you're like, but you know what, candidate one, they have a degree from this school or they worked at this amazing startup or, um, you know, so-and-so was such a big enthusiastic endorser of them and they're, they're at my company. Uh, so maybe I should think about candidate one. Uh, the answer is you go with candidate three. <laughs> uh, you could talk yourself in to hiring people, but if you have to talk yourself into hiring someone, you probably shouldn't hire them. Like there usually is some super intelligence in your brain uh, that is leading you not to pick candidate one. Now, there are times where it could be unconscious bias. It could be um, some subjective, um, you know, uh, you know, rules of thumb that you've developed that aren't really accurate. Um, but if you've been doing this enough that you're now hiring managers of people, you have enough track record and, you know, uh, repetitions to start to develop good pattern recognition. And yeah, from time to time, you could experiment with going against your gut. But when I look at all the hires I made, I don't really think there were many where I'm, where my gut was saying, this person is not going to be good. And then I hire them and I'm like, oh my God, they're amazing. It can happen. It definitely can happen. 
But there's probably more times where my gut was like, ah, oh, I don't know. But then I find myself extending an offer. And then, like, they may not be a disaster, but uh, it's less often that they exceed expectations than uh, when the gut is good. Now, don't over-index on the gut. The gut should only be a tiebreaker. If you do, th there's a reason why this is the last question. If you do this as the first question, you're gonna make some bad mistakes. You're gonna have a great gut feel about someone and they're gonna not be great. So definitely go in order, like solve the problem, you know, find the chemistry, find the complementary skills, get buy-in and input from everybody else on what the problem you're solving is, um, take a test drive, do the reference checks. And then once you have all of that data, then your gut has enough to um, you know, play a role. If you go gut first, you're just going to look at resumes and maybe your screening call chemistry. And you know that's, that's imperfect, uh, more imperfect than looking at most of that info. So hopefully this was useful to you. Um, feel free to like and share it if you think it was uh, worthwhile. I put uh, stuff like this out all the time on uh, a variety of places, like on LinkedIn, you can follow me at uh, Tom L. I have a Substack, firesidepm.substack.com. Uh, this video is on LinkedIn, YouTube, and the audio of it is on the Fireside PM podcast. And uh, if you wanted more help, uh, I do offer executive coaching, uh, either one-on-one, -on -one, or I also uh, have recently been doing more work for entire product teams, where usually the product lead is asking me to uh, do some workshops with the whole team and then follow up with some one-on-one -on -one coaching for team members. So that's also an option. You can connect with me uh, in any of these ways and uh, hope you all have a great rest of your week and uh, let's get back to work.